really grateful um, to be here today. Actually, let me start over. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone at USC. I want to thank the dean and the office of the dean. I want to thank Dr. Jennifer Gunter. I want to thank Brianna Ashford Carroll. I want to thank Dean Hardy. I want to thank all of you for being flexible. I haven't had the flu since I was in high school. I haven't been sick like this since I was in high school. I've been, it's been a week that has laid me out. And the thing that's really made me a bit humble, I'm a bit of a control freak. You know, I think that I got everything managed. And of course, this reminded me that I'm not in charge. And so I'm incredibly um, grateful at your generosity and creating space for me to show up there because, of course, I'd much rather be there in person, but it's a good thing I'm not. Um, and so I apologize in advance. I've taken cough suppressants and I've got hot tea and cough drops the whole nine yards. And hopefully uh, <clears throat> I won't need any of them for an hour, for the next hour or so. Um, so my first time at USC was actually in 2014. It was after Black Faces, White Spaces um, came out and the fabulous poet Nikki Finney invited me. It was part of a... I wrote it down here, it was part of a series there called Black Radical Thought and the Contemporary South. And I had a fantastic time. I had a fantastic time with the audience and telling my story. And I was just kind of fresh coming up. You know, my book had just come out. So I had a lot of things to say about that. Um, so I'm happy to be back even in this form. Uh, so I wrote here, what does justice demand? You know, I was thinking about your summit and thinking about you know, environmental justice being the primary theme. Um, and thinking about it in terms of, I think a lot of us are throwing around words like collapse and disintegration and division. And that often makes us feel like we have no choice, right? And I can understand actually why that might make us feel um, hopeless or feel like, what can I do? You know, apathetic to that moment. Um, and I am reminded of our agency. I'm reminded of my own agency. Um, so I am going to share my screen and put up some images while I'm talking. Um, because I can. Bam, y'all. Okay, things are breaking. That's good. Um, I'm calling this talk on vision, justice, and playing the long game. So... A couple of weeks ago, um, the philosopher, the brilliant thinker, Cornell West, came to Burlington, Vermont. I live in Burlington, Vermont the last three and a half years. And he came and spoke at the Flynn Theater downtown. Now, I had a chance to see Cornell West back in the 90s when he did a series with Bell Hooks in New York City called Breaking Bread. And I just have a lot of respect for Cornell West as a thinker. And so I, of course, had to go see him. And it was an amazing evening. He talked about, he talked about democracy. He talked about um, environmental justice, racial justice. He talked about um, moral imagination. He talked about ethics. He talked about love. He had no notes either, by the way. Um, he held all those things together in a very perfect way. But the, almost the very first thing he said was, what kind of human being are you choosing to be? What kind of human being are you choosing to be? And it was at that moment I got reminded again of my own agency that regardless of what's going on around me, and there's always things going on systemically, there's always things going on structurally around me, there's still, I still have an option in, in order in, to think about what kind of human being that I'm choosing to be and how does my practice actually reflect that. So I was thinking about how I want to be, I wrote here, compassionate, empathetic, generous, vulnerable, open, and coming correct to any relationship I have, be it another human or another species, right? And um, I was uplifted like everyone was in the audience and afterwards came out, had a chance to meet him. I was just feeling hopeful again and just excited. And because the universe has a serious sense of humor, as I believe, a few days later, it decided to test me because I thought I was even feeling a bit cocky about myself, thinking, oh, that's right, I'm empathetic, generous, compassionate, I'm all the things, I know how to meet people, I'm coming to it with love, no problem. A few days later, 
I got an email. Now, I do a lot of talks and engagement around some version of this conversation, race, place, belonging, identity, diversity, justice, all the time, all around the country. And so I mostly get emails once in a while from people I've never met or they've read the book or, you know, thanking me or saying something nice or asking for some further assistance. But like most people, you know, you get nine emails that are just thanking you and saying really nice things to you. It's those are the nine I really remember. It's the 10th one that isn't very nice. So I got an email. This was just, again, a few weeks ago. And it was signed. She wrote, her first name is Sarah. Her Actually, her whole name was there. I don't know that she realized that. But her, she was Sarah. And Sarah proceeded to tell me that she was in a, at a National Park Service Center. And I couldn't tell whether she worked there or not. So the implication was she might work for the Park Service. And she said <laughs> that she saw my racist book, Black Faces, White Spaces, and she decided to put a non-racist book in front of my racist book. And then she proceeded to call me a racist at least three times, as well as my book, Racist, three times, and reminded me that the world needs more harmony, not disharmony, and I need to stop being racist. And white people are great. And then she signed it, Sarah the Great. Now, I know that some people would just laugh at that. Um, and I had two thoughts. And none of them were about empathy, compassion, kindness, love, all that stuff that I was feeling. I wasn't feeling any of that, right? I was feeling uh, two things. <laughs> One, I, some things I really wanted to say to her. And again, none of those other things that I should have been feeling, right? And the second was I felt deeply hurt. I felt like somebody had socked me in my stomach. You know, I am pretty thin skinned for things like that. And I, wanted to cry. So both the things, neither one of them, again, about the compassion, empathy, uh, I didn't have any of those feelings for Sarah the Great. Um, and so I've been thinking about continuously, again, what kind of human being are you choosing to be? And it's easy to say that when you're feeling good about things, but how about when you are not? Um, I want to talk a little bit about, I'm going to come back to that, but um, why I do this work. So Earlier this summer, um, I got an incredible opportunity to spend a week at Camp Denali in Denali, Alaska, National Park in Alaska. And Camp Denali is a high-end, low-impact camp. It's a series of beautiful lodges and outhouses, the most beautiful outhouses you've ever been in. I'm here to tell you it's the most beautiful outhouse I've ever been in, um, where they have their own greenhouse and everything is on solar. And people who fly into it, they pay $1,100 a night. The food is amazing. Everything is just perfect. And they have a program where they invite authors who write about nature, talk about nature to come in um, and you spend a week there and you go on hikes during the day. And in the evening, you're the entertainment to have these conversations. So I was very excited. It was a long trip from Burlington and I flew out of Burlington and I had to change planes in Newark on my way to Anchorage. And I had a few hours in the airport and I'm walking around and you know those uh, electrical, those elect, uh, not electrical shops, but like uh, places you can go to get phone cords or anything like that. Um, and I walked in there and I can't remember why I walked in there. There was a young African-American man who perked up as soon as I walked in. I think he was just happy to have a customer. And we started talking I loved his young energy and he was just happy and vibrant. And finally he said, so where are you going? And I said, I'm going to Alaska. And he got, he got very animated and he went, why are you going to Alaska? And he said it like that. And I kind of did a stage whisper. And I said, tell them about black people. And he went, oh, yes, 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 you have to go. You have to go to Alaska. And he just kind of smiled. And actually, for me, it wasn't about a reflection on Alaska but it was in part a reflection on how he thought of himself or myself in Alaska and what he thought that might mean. Since 2020, um, 2020 was kind of momentous as it was for so many of us, I think. Um, George Floyd's murder, Christian Cooper walking into Central Park and having his skin weaponized against him, the COVID pandemic. Um, 
my professional life exploded. It was a strange balance for me, right? I, I'm a, sort of alone here in Vermont. And for a minute there, I thought I lost most of the work that I do in the world. And then suddenly it exploded after that. I wrote a piece for The Guardian and I haven't stopped since then. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. And I tell people that I'm also quite exhausted because it's a lot of emotional labor to have these conversations. I love what I do. And it's a lot of emotional labor. And, you know, thinking about how to hold that, both my gratitude for being able to work, consult, to advise, to think about these issues of racial and social justice and environmental justice. And what does it mean for us as human beings to be in better relationship with each other? Um, but I want to go back to Black Faces, White Spaces and why I wrote that book. So last fall, the New York Times, they had done a year long series called Black History Continued. And I guess they thought, they realized they had never really talked about the environment as far as Black history had to do. So they in, invited a bunch of people to write various articles. Um, there was an article on Black surfers. There was an article on Black foragers. There was a fabulous piece on the wonderful Betty Reese Hoskin, the oldest um, ranger in the Park Service, who's 101 and still looking fabulous. Um, and they asked me to write an article to tie it all up to think about, is there a Black environmental imaginary? Is there something like a new Black frontier in the environment? And I, I did that. It took three months working back and forth with the editors to really think about who were some of the figures out there that I'd want to write about. And eventually they asked me to also include myself in there a little bit, which I did as well. At one point, the editor, one of the editors said to me, so, you know, this is so great. You're telling me stories about these amazing black people, both his historically as well as in the present. Can you talk about how they've inspired you to do this work? And I kind of smiled and I had to say to him, well, of course they're inspirational, but I started this work before I knew who they were, because that's not exactly what inspired me to do the work. I knew they were out there. I just didn't know who they were at the time. Um, and one of the reasons that I wrote Black Faces, White Spaces is because, you know, I'm working on my doctorate in geography back in 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. And when I started doing research on African Americans in the environment, I'd go to the library shelves and I couldn't find anything on African Americans in the environment. There was a little bit on environmental justice, which is powerful and important. But what bothered me was there was a ton of stuff about nature writers and scientists and other points of view about the environment coming from white authors. But where were the black stories? You know, we're not just the bad things that happen to us. We're not just part of some amorphous community, right? We're individuals, we're diverse, we have ideas, we are resilient, we are creative, like anybody would be. And I wanted to know where those stories were. Um, there's an article that came out maybe about a year and a half ago now in the Paris Review, and it's by a Black writer named Maura Cheeks. And the title of the article it, it is, Isn't Black Representation What We Wanted? Um, and in the article, she talks about the Jewish author, Fran Lebowitz, who asked the question, why does everyone want to see themselves in books? He's having a conversation with Martin Scorsese, and she said she doesn't understand people who complain about not seeing themselves in books. Quote, a book is not supposed to be a mirror, she says. It's supposed to be a door. Well, Maura Cheeks, the writer, responds by saying, quote, I understand the sentiment, but I disagree with the argument. It's the type of sentiment that can only be felt by someone who was unknowingly represented almost everywhere she turned. She didn't know what she had. A little bit later in the article, um, Leibowitz has a conversation with the black writer, Toni Morrison. And Toni Morrison says, I am the reader of the books I write. And Leibowitz pushes back and says, you are not, you, you, your other readers aren't you. And Morrison just laughs and replies, yes, they are, right? So I've been thinking about the question of representation in terms of whose stories are centered, who is centered, how we all frame our understanding and where our biases come into play. When I think about people like Henry David Thoreau and John Muir, 
Um, I don't have to dismiss them. I don't want to actually, or cancel them out. But I think about how their voices and experiences have defined a set of practices and memories of who we are as human beings and as Americans in relationship to our non-human nature here. And it becomes something that's supposed to be, this is what everybody experiences. And of course, it's not what everybody experiences, right? Including, and I want to say people of European descent, right? Not everybody experiences that, right? And finally, I also want to say that I am also that young man at the airport in Newark who was challenged to see himself in Alaska, accepted, seen, and welcomed. So I often ask the question, um, both to myself and to audiences, is, you know, who do you stand with? And the reason I ask that question, this is maybe six, seven years ago now, I was standing um, online to get on the plane in SFO in San Francisco. And there was a South Asian woman in front of me. And then there were two women of European descent standing behind me. And we were getting ready to board. And suddenly the flight attendant comes out and says, you know, there's a delay. And we did that thing that a lot of people do. The four of us started talking. And somebody said, oh, what do you do? And I, I must have said something around diversity, race. But I must have said something like that. And the women of European descent said, oh, yes, that's so important, you know, and it's so important to be empathetic. Well, the South Asian woman had been really quiet, but she looked really serious. And she finally looked at the three of us. She said, you know, I've been to 75 countries. I go around and talk about diversity and inclusion to businesses. Empathy and sympathy are nice, but who do you stand with? And she didn't crack a smile, not once. I got on the plane, I wrote that down in my journal, like, oh my gosh, who do I stand with? <clears throat> and I realized in order to really know who I stand with, it's not enough to say, I stand with this community or this individual or this organization. I first have to know where it is that I stand because coming correct to any relationship means my biases have to be clear because we're all biased right? Bias for me is about a point of view. It's a personal history. It is an experience that we don't have to deny or erase, but we have to be clear on what it is. How else can you come to a relationship in a way that's, mm, that builds trust? You know, I don't look to someone to be perfect. I just look for a way that we can meet each other where we are and then come into conversation and decide where it is we might like to go together and how to do that. I asked I teach one class at Middlebury, and it, I, I have them spend the entire semester doing their environmental autobiography. They, they start off with a three-page, four-page assignment at the beginning, and I say, talk about a place out there in the world that has really influenced you, a piece of land, a campground, your grandma's garden, whatever it is. You don't have to defend it. Just talk about how it's shaped the way you think of non-human nature, how you think of yourself in that. And then once they've done that, they spend the rest of the semester investigating that same place, all the things that they don't know about it, all the people they can find who may have come before, all the species on that piece of environment, the people that have abutted that over time. How has it changed? How does this then deepen and expand the story of who you are in relation to place and how they might make that discovery for themselves? So in order for me to do that, and some of you may have heard me tell this story before, but I have to tell it again, and it has expanded, especially in the last two years, I have to tell the story of where it is that I grew up. But I, I have to say one more thing first, because I got to talk about one of my favorite human beings, um, which is Brian Stevenson, the African-American lawyer who has been to the Supreme Court at least five times. He works to get Black men and Black teenagers off death row. Um, he started the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Alabama. He is just I didn't realize it until about two years ago. I hadn't heard of him for some, somehow I hadn't heard of him until I watched a documentary about him on HBO and I was blown away by who this man was. I was also blown away and very excited when I found out we were the exact same age, born one day apart. Um, and I was feeling a way about that. Um, and uh, the interviewer asked him why he does what he does because he doesn't have at least at the time that he was interviewed, he didn't have a partner, he doesn't have kids, and all he does is work. And I was like, oh yeah, that's, all those things are true for me. 
<laughs> I don't have kids. I'm not, I don't have a partner and all I do is work. Um, and so I was kind of nodding very vigorously, right? And he, the first thing he said when she said, well, why do you do what you do? He said, I do what I do because the system is broken. And I said, oh yeah, that's it. I wrote that down. Um, and then he thought about it a little more and he said, well, I do what I do because people are broken. And I went, oh, that's it too. Wrote that down. And then he's got, his voice got kind of soft and he said, I do what I do because I'm broken too. And that laid me out <laughs> because I went, oh, there it is right there, right? And I understood that all three of those things are always in tandem, right? Wherever you go, there you are. Um, that it's not simply about something outside of myself that I hope to, you know, be take part in transforming with the larger community, but also there's something inside of myself that I hope to do, right? Um, um, so I got to talk a little bit about where I grew up. Um, so I'm originally from New York and I, you know, if I was in front of you, I would get a little attitude about it, you know, even though I haven't lived in New York in a lot of years, um, it's where I was born and raised, but I got to go back a little bit and talk about my parents, Rose and Henry, who grew up in the South. They grew up in Floyd, Virginia, um, which is by the Blue Ridge Mountains, and they grew up very poor. Uh, both in large families. Um, they both have a high school education. My dad went to fight the Korean War. And when he came back from the Korean War, right, so remember Jim Crow segregations in place. And he told me that he saw a park ranger in a park ranger uniform. And he thought that was like a great government job. And so he went to apply for it, you know, as a vet, you know, this, this seems like it would be a really nice fit. And what they told him was, I'm sorry, but we don't hire Negroes. And so my parents joined the Great Migration, like a lot of Black folks who left the South to move north, and he came to New York. He had a sister who was a nurse, who had um, been very successful and had you know, married a contractor and was, had kids. So he decided to move to New York. And my father had two job offers. Uh, the first was a job in Syracuse, New York, which is about five hours north of New York City, where he could have been a janitor. He didn't take that job. The second job was 30 minutes outside of New York City in Westchester County. A very wealthy Jewish family owned a 12-acre estate, and they needed full-time caretakers to live on that estate. And so that's the job my father took. Um, so for about the next six or seven pictures or so, they're all going to be pictures of this estate. The picture you're seeing up there now is the gardener's cottage. There were two houses on the property, the gardener's co cottage, which is where my family lived, and of the bigger house that the owners would come up to on weekends and holidays. Um, my father was the chauffeur. He was the gardener, um, the caretaker. My mom was a sometime housekeeper for the other house when the owners would come up. Um, my parents um, thought they couldn't have kids um, because my mother, or like a lot of women who are poor, regardless of the color of their skin, she had to go into the hospital to have a cyst removed from one of her ovaries. And they put the cyst and without asking her permission, they just decided to remove one of her ovaries. And when she woke up, they told her, well, we didn't ask your permission because we didn't think you could emotionally handle the information. So my mother went into a depression. She's dealt with depression a lot in her life, but that was a really bad time because here she was isolated. This is a beautiful piece of property with a swimming pool and a, and a lake and gardens and um, flower gardens, vegetable gardens, fruit trees. I mean, it's stunning, but it's a wealthy, all white neighborhood. She was there pretty much on her own with my father and um, her um, and, and my father's sister down the road, you know, in another part of town. And it, it was really hard for her when she realized she couldn't have kids. Well, in steps the owners, and I only learned this about two years ago, is that the owners asked them if they had thought about adoption. And with their help, the owner's help, they adopted me from Spence Chapin in New York City. And then what I always say is they relaxed and had my first brother. And then they relaxed some more and had my second brother. <laughs> Um, so my brothers and I grew up on this property. This is where we learned to do 
all the things that many of us learned to do outside. We knew how to swim by the time we were seven years old. We had to because we were on this property with water. We were kids, you know, it's a 12 acre property. So we had to know that this is where I learned to ride my bike and play in the woods and be outside. And I will say to you that it was an, a tremendous privilege to be on this land and have those kinds of experiences. I get that. It really is. And it really was. Um, also, I never forgot that we were black. And so uh, I'm 62, so born in 59. And so that means it was the 60s. I was kind of growing up, you know, when I was small on the property. Um, and I say that because this, when I say this was an all white wealthy neighborhood, Harry Winston had property down the street. Schaefer of Schaefer Beer lived next door. We were the only family of color in that neighborhood until the 1990s when a Japanese American woman moved in for a bit and then she moved out. So I, you know, I was a Girl Scout. I was delivering Girl Scout cookies. My first job was a paper route when I was up there, when I was 13. People asked me to babysit the neighborhood. So I, would, I did the things that you often do in your neighborhood, but what was really clear, my family and I weren't like everyone else. The story that really got me, uh, it gave me a sense of how I might be and my family might be out of place here is one day in fourth grade when I was walking home from school. Now, fourth grade, I went to a public school in the Maranek, and in those days, you know, you could walk home, nobody worried about it, it wasn't far. And I had a little Afro in my little school bag, and I was walking home, and there were always policemen patrolling this neighborhood. The road was just a two-lane road going like this. And I was right around the corner from the house, and a white policeman in his car stopped me and he wanted to know where I was going. And I gave him the full address. And he just looked at me and said, oh, do you work there? And I'm thinking, I'm nine. <laughs> and I, all I said in confusion was, no, I live there. And he let me go. <laughs> I went home. I told my family. My father got furious and called the police station and he really gave him hell. And I never bothered myself or my brothers again. But as an adult, I have to ask about the logic of that situation. What was it about me that I was, I, 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 we were in the 60s. We weren't in the 1800s. Like, how, why would I be working there? You know, what was it about me that made it seem unnatural that I could simply be living there? Like a lot of other children that lived there at that time in the neighborhood. I want to jump ahead a little bit into the 1990s. So the patriarch of the family had long since passed away and the matriarch now was very sick. My parents had been living and caring for this land at this point over 40 years. And to her credit, she wants to think about what is gonna to happen to my parents when he passed away. She considered even briefly about keeping my parents on this land. Now this land was worth over $3 million in the 90s, um, property taxes, or over $125,000 a year. Excuse me, my, my, my parents weren't making anything like that. And so at the end of the day, it wasn't going to work out for a variety of reasons. So she had a house built for them in Leesburg, Virginia. Because at this point, me and my brothers were grown. Now we're talking, it's the 90s, right? We're grown. My youngest brother is married and has kids and he lives in Leesburg. So it seemed like the safest place for them to go, even though my father swore he was never moving back to the state of Virginia. Um, and had a lovely house built for them on a half acre of land. When the owner died, she had my father at her request by her bedside when she died. Because the thing for me is to remember that power is complicated and so is love is complicated, right? Um, it doesn't mean that I can't be critical about it, but I recognize so many things. You know, it's hard for me to imagine how I would have been in their lives if the owner hadn't paid for my adoption. It's hard for me to imagine, you know, the things that I've gained from this living on this land wouldn't have happened if the owners hadn't given my parents that job. There's, it complicates, and I know my father had love for the owner yeah, and all of its complications that come with it. So she passed away and the new owner came on and asked my parents to stay on until 2003. And you're looking at, this gate wasn't here on the driveway when 
my the other owner was there. It was quite an open space, but the new owner put this gate on. And um, in 2003, my parents said they finally had to go because they were in their 70s at this point. But now they've been caring for this land for nearly 50 years. And after they left and moved to Leesburg, and they had a lovely, they have a lovely house there. My father in particular got incredibly depressed and he talked about missing the land. He talked about having no legacy, you know, no money, but more importantly, I think for him, it was having no land. And it didn't matter what I said or my brother said that, you know, you've given us everything and none of that mattered. And so um, about five years after they moved, six years or so, they got a copy of a letter from the Westchester Land Trust. And I got a copy of it. They gave it to me. And the letter had pictures of the property and was letting everyone know in the old neighborhood that a conservation easement had now been placed on that piece of property. And it spoke about all the reasons why that was important. The wildlife on the property and the different tree species on the property and where the property sits in the watershed. And I actually agreed with it all. At the end of the letter, um, the conservation folks thank the new owner for his conservation mindedness. And he'd been on that land for five, six years. There was nothing in the letter thanking my parents who cared for that land for nearly 50 years. And just like that, they were gone. They were no longer a part of the environmental history. They were no longer part of the story of stewardship. They were no longer part of any piece of this. There was no accountability. There was no responsibility to their memory. There was nothing. And that is the thing that actually drove me. So in 2003, when I started working on this, I wasn't only thinking about African-Americans. I was thinking about all the people in the history of this country, and particularly people of color who have been erased, dismin di diminished, dismissed, um, made invisible in this story, this larger story about who we are in relationship to the environment, who has something to say, who has something to contribute, who has always contributed and always been here. Um, so yeah, I'm biased. I am definitely biased because I believe we can do better. Um, I think about... Um, moments of convergence. And it's just, this, I, this is one of the few slides that I tend to always use because I think we always have, um, we're always at a moment of convergence, right? When we're thinking about who we are and who we've been. And I put these images up here. You can see in the background, the famous mural of George Floyd and surrounding George Floyd for me is all the images I think about pollution done to the land, Japanese internment, indigenous removal from the land, um, immigrants crossing the border, um, people of Chinese descent working the railroad, uh, slavery, right? And I think about people like Gifford Pinchot, who founded the Forest Service and this idea of forest management. And I think about President Roosevelt and John Muir in 1903 on overhanging rock in Yosemite, having and a very important conversation about ideas such as wilderness and how we protect these spaces. My problem is not in simply that they had those conversations, but I want to know what else was going on at the same time, right? In 1903, Jim Crow segregation. So who were they talking about to have universal rights? And what does that mean to be able to show up at a time that so many people in this country could not do that. And oh, by the way, if we go back in history just a little bit farther to 1862 and think about the Homestead Act, when for the most part, if you were of European descent, you could put your stake down on up to 160 acres. And if you stayed on it for five years, and if you built a home, and if you gardened, and if you stayed on it for five years, that land could be yours free and clear. Wow, and I am taking nothing away from people of European descent because something like 60% of them didn't make it. That was hard work. And many of them had to leave the homes that they knew because they couldn't stay on the land that they knew where their blood, sweat, and tears were. And they took a huge risk coming over here. But I also have to be able to ask at the same time who had to be killed and or removed in order for them to have that chance. 
It's complicated. What happens, you know, with the Emancipation Proclamation when people of African descent were originally given 400,000 acres of land until white plantation owners said, oh, my God, we just gave people who were our property land. And land is never just about land. It is about economic and political power. It is about the right to say you belong. It is about legacy. I don't think so. And take all that land back. And these are just little drops in the bucket, right? No matter how far down the road we get, those truths still remain truths, which doesn't make us bad people. It just makes us people who have done things, who are complicit in different ways at different times. It tells us something about who we've been. And if we are unwilling to look at that, how do we think we're going to do any better moving forward? in terms of who we say we want to be. Um, I think about the larger environmental narrative. You know, I've got this picture of John Muir up here, and I've been sort of fascinated with him the last couple of years, in part because he's been called out a lot publicly for his racism, in, in his own words, in many of his writings. And um, particularly after Christian Cooper, who self-identifies as a black gay birder when he had his skin weaponized against him in Central Park by um, the white woman, Amy Cooper. And I'm not here to diminish or dismiss Amy Cooper any more than she's already been. And I actually don't think that served us to dismiss her. Um, I think that there's another conversation here to be had about what she may have learned and what we may have learned in the process. But I want to come back to John Muir for a minute, because when all of these things were coming out in the headlines, his great, great grandson, Robert Hanna, reached out to me and said, you know, I would love it if you would come on my podcast and have a conversation with me about this. And I said, sure, I'll do that. And he has his own built-in audience. And we got on the podcast and he said, um, he was introducing me to his audience, and he said, well, as you all know, the headlines have been calling my great-great-grandfather a racist, and CNN was calling me for a response, and NPR, and all the big stations. My phone was ringing off the hook. He said, I, it was like I thought something had happened to one of my family members, and I interrupted him, and I said, that's because something did happen to one of your family members. You know, to remember that means I have no problem critiquing John Muir, but I'm also inter interested in the role of redemption and the ability to transform and change, and that he is connected to a family of people perhaps trying to do differently and to, to own and reconcile what may have come before, but to know that there is the possibility of being different now. And for me to think about how to hold both those things, hold them authentically, right? Um, and hold them, again, with that compassion, that empathy, that discernment, as opposed to the judgment, right? Because I believe in something higher um, and want to find my way there as best as I can. Uh, this is just the first chapter of my book, and it's pretty much the same, the idea that the environmental narrative in, I think we've been bamboozled by it, that somehow there's this universal narrative. And if we go out into that nature outside of ourselves, that all the issues having to do with equity and justice and racism will suddenly disappear. And you know, it's not true because wherever we go as human beings, there we are, right? And we take ourselves with us everywhere. Right, And so I also don't think that that serves us either, which doesn't mean we can't continue to appreciate and find joy um, in nature and what it can give us. So I often put this slide up too in the last two years where I call it stories of now, right? Thinking about how in 2020 with the COVID pandemic and the rise of Black Lives Matter and the murder of George Floyd, and not just George Floyd, but understanding that he really elevated the conversation in a very particular way, as well as the political divisions that are all rife now more than perhaps they've ever been. Um, and I was watching CNN when the guilty verdict came down for Derek Chauvin, and 
Jake Tapper, who is a white newscaster, was having a conversation with the black newscaster, um, uh, the black newscaster, oh my gosh, Don Lemon. And um, Jake Tapper was saying that, he said, you know, in 2016, you couldn't get any uh, famous celebrity, white celebrity or politician to say words like white supremacy or Black Lives Matter. He said, but now, 2020, 2021, you know, they're all saying it all over the place. And he looked at Don Lemon and he said, don't you think there's been a sea change? And Don Lemon, being Don Lemon, had a look on his face and I said, ooh, I know something's coming. And Don Lemon said to him, there may have been a sea change in terms of awareness, but there hasn't been a sea change in terms of practice. And I really took that to heart because I think awareness is, is an important step, right, in our growth and in, in our expansion of ourselves and who we say we want to be and how we want to show up. But it isn't enough to be aware, right? It just isn't enough. It's the beginning. It just isn't enough. And so what are we doing in our practice? What is it that we're willing to change? What are we tackling on the daily, right, in order to do what we do differently? I wrote here, but, you know, I believe for any practice to work well, for you to meet a person or a community where they are, you've got to be willing to embrace who we've been and challenge the ways and means, rules and regulations we have institutionalized for doing the work that we do that at best does not recognize different people, ideas or experiences, and at worst extracts, transacts, diminishes and erases ideas, experiences, and ultimately people. So um, a few years ago, the photographer Chris Bach um, did a series of photographs. He called it Let's Talk About Race. And I'm just going to put up this one image. And I'm calling it flipping the script. And it's pretty self-explanatory, right? You see a young white girl is at a toy store, and she's looking up at some shelves, and all the dolls are black and brown. Some of the other images he had up were it was a nail salon and you had women of Asian descent sitting in the chairs having getting pedicures and the women giving pedicures were of European descent. And there was another image of a very wealthy Latinx woman with her little dog and her fancy house and, and her housekeeper was a woman of European descent and challenging what the stories are. What happens if we flip the script? I, again, I really want to emphasize for me, it is not removing people from the equation. You know, we've been removing people from the equation of trying to do that since the founding of this country. Why we would ever want to continue doing that practice on anybody, I don't understand and where we think that's going to make us better as a community, right? Um, and what does it mean to flip the script and imagine a different story? right? If you put somebody else in that position and how that changes things. There was the, um, the um, series Lovecraft Country that came out, I believe, in 2020, 2021, and was one of my favorite series, right, on HBO. And it was based on the book of H.P. Lovecraft. And it's about, there's witches and monsters, and it's set in the 1950s. Excuse me. And the series focused on, uh, it was centered around a working class African American family who lived in Chicago. And in the opening episode, without me giving anything else away, if you haven't seen the show, <coughs> it talked about, um, they found out that they had in Massachusetts some white relatives who were witches. And so they were going to do this big road trip across the country and find out what's going on and find one of their missing relatives. And there was going to be a whole like Indiana Jones adventure going on there. And as they were piling into their car, getting ready to go, the matriarch of the family who was going to stay behind with one of the younger children, you know, was very casually, you know, had a list he pulled out and wanted to make sure they had everything they needed in the car. And everybody was excited the way people get excited when there's a road trip about to happen, right? And she says, whoa, whoa, you know, she's like, calm down, everybody. Let's just make sure you have everything, you know, blankets, food. And she was referencing the Green Book. I mean, it was Jim Crow segregation. So, you know, you know, these, these are three Black people who are about to drive cross country, 
you know, to Massachusetts, you better make sure you have what you need because you may not find a hotel that will accept you. There may not be a place for you to get food. You may not have a place to sleep. And so I, that reference really blew me away because it was almost a throwaway reference, but it was there, right? And the beauty of that for me was how, you know, if you're going to talk about a Black family in any real way having this, this adventure, you have to talk about that because that was also part of their truth. Later on in the episode, they're somewhere in Massachusetts and they get pulled over by a white state trooper and it's right before the sun is about to set. And he comes over looking kind of ferocious and he says, you know where you are? This is a sundown county. You have something like seven minutes. And if you don't get out of this county within seven minutes, I can't make any promises. and I'm going to follow you until, <laughs> until that point. And they make it out. Okay. And later they have fights in the woods with these big monsters and other stuff goes down. But what made the story so powerful for me is because the way there was complexity to the story. They could tell the story of adventure and monsters and um, <clears throat> people willing to take risks and understanding that because these folks were African American there was another layer in there that was also taking hold every single time, which, oh, by the way, didn't stop them from doing what it is they needed to do. Um, so um, I also want to talk about, um, I say this um, often, I call it the baby in the bathtub. Well, because I talk a lot with organizations and institutions and um, outdoor retailing businesses and who are especially predominantly white, organizations, institutions, and businesses who ask me what is it that they can do, and I can always give a list, and we, I talk with them about that. I say, you know, at the end of the day, um, well, let me back up a little bit. So I'm thinking about um, the, the Atlantic. The Atlantic, about a year and a half or so ago, yeah, came out with this amazing article by the indigenous writer David Truer. And in this article, he goes on, he had done a significant research. He was talking about land in the United States and he was talking about different tribes. And he calmly lays out all this information and this data, what it means to be indigenous on this land. And at the very end, he says, yeah, the National Park Service should give all the land back to native people to steward. And boom, period, we're done, drop, mic drop, we're out. And so for me, it's less about whether you agree that should happen or not, but are we even prepared to have that conversation? What does it mean to talk about decentering whiteness? And I mean, and I want to, you know, I always pull on James Baldwin for this, right? Whiteness is not a bad thing, right? Nobody can help the skin they were born in. But in this country, whiteness is about power. And what does it mean to decenter it and have this, be able to even have this conversation across our differences? And I'm not even going to bring up reparations, which really complicates the issue even further, right? Who owns the land? Who, who gets reparated? Who gets land back? I don't know, you know, but are we even ready to have that conversation? And I tell organizations, you know, you don't have to throw out the baby in the bathwater. There are people who have developed skills, have put in time, have commitment and love. Um, but I do think you need a new bathtub. If you think you can do all this different stuff with the same organizational structure, the same hierarchies, the same kind of um, um, leadership, you know, that sort of a mega charismatic leader at the top, if you think you can still do your work that way, this new work, I've got news for you. We've been trying to do that for years. It doesn't work. Right. So I think you have to be able to be willing to throw out the bathtub. Um, um, I talk about all the time about a, a willingness to take a risk in order to gain, as opposed to um, taking a risk in order to not lose something, which is really different. You know, when you, you see something going away and you're like, oh, I'm trying to hang on to that. But taking a risk to gain is, has something to say about faith. It has something to say about what you believe in and what you're willing to risk for. Um, a number of years ago, Svetlana Lazievich won the Nobel Prize for her work on Belarus and talking about Chernobyl, and she's from there. And I remember when she was on 
NPR with Michelle Martin. And a lot of her people, Michelle Martin said to her, you made a lot of your own people uncomfortable. They're really angry with you because Svetlana Lazievich said some true stuff about her people. She, you know, they dropped the ball, the government. I mean, she just let them have it. And when Michelle Martin said that to her, um, her response was, I love my people, but I'm not interested in them being comfortable. I want them to be better, right? Um, and so the question is, again, it's not about anybody's comfort, which is not the same as saying that people shouldn't be able to feel safe. And we can have that conversation as well. So I want to go back to um, my parents' story and how what's changed over the last two years. And I have to take a cough drop there for a second. Um, mm. So... In 2019, I had a chance to speak at the Telluride Film Festival, um, Mountain Films. It it happens every May. It's the smaller film festival that focuses on environmental films. And that year, the theme was equity and environment. So they invited Robin DiAngelo, who wrote wrote White Privilege, myself, and a number of other writers um, and thinkers, transgendered, um, Latinx, different kinds of people to come in to talk to this primarily, predominantly white, very well-heeled audience in Telluride of filmmakers and people from the region. It was an amazing situation. I had 20 minutes to get on stage. Cheryl Strait, who wrote Wild, opened the session for us and Milk the Singer came out and did a song on a piano live. I was going, wow, this is how the other half lives, okay. And I came and just did a quick thing and I said, whose story counts? And I told the story of where I grew up. Well, it ended and it went well. And um, many months later in um, summer of 2020, I got an email from a director who had been in the audience, a white director named Irene Taylor, who has won Emmys and Peabody's for her work. And I realized I had actually seen some of her documentary work. And she wanted to get on Zoom with me, and I did. And she said, you know, um, HBO is commissioning me to do a documentary about trees. And what I want to do is tell the story of um, different real people in relationship to different species of trees. So one of the stories she's going to tell, for instance, is of the Weyerhaeuser family, who's made a lot of money off timber. And she said, she realized when she had all these stories lined up that she possibly was going to tell that she didn't have a single story in there about an African-American. And she said, you know, I thought about you asking whose story counts and can you help me think about what that might be? And I said, yes. And I'm still in a little trickster. I was feeling a little bit like a trickster. So I, I was looking at her and I kind of smiled and I said, well, if you're going to tell the story of, you know, black people in trees in the United States, you might want to talk about lynching. Like, you know, she kind of balked a little bit and she said, you're probably right. She goes, but I'm not the person to do that. And I said, and you know, we're not just bad things that happen to us. And so I told her this little story of my parents just to give her another framing of how she might think about it. You know, when my parents were still living on the land, Uh, For their 40th wedding anniversary, my father gave my mother that tree standing behind them, a weeping cherry tree, Prunus pendula, and it was much smaller at the time. Um, This picture was taken on the last day they were on the property in 2003, but my father had given this to her many years earlier, and it was both surprising because my father isn't the big romantic gesture type of guy, but for some reason, he must have been feeling it that year, and when they left, I obviously, they couldn't take the tree with them because their roots were too deep in the ground. So I told her that story. That that was it. And she liked the story so much, the short of it is, she says, can I tell the story of your family on this land? Because what I had also done at the same time was the New York Botanical Gardens had reached out and said, you know, you know, we'd love to have you come down here and do this residency. And for some reason, I'm on Zoom, and I told them this story, too. I, I don't know why I told it, but I did. And the woman I was spoken to, speaking to, said, you know, we're at the New York Botanical Gardens. I bet you we could get access to that property, get a grafting of that tree, bring it back to the New York Botanical Gardens, and tell the story of your parents. And I was blown away. I was like, what's happening in 2020? I said, yeah, oh, my God, that's a great idea. And so the filmmaker was saying, can we come up? We'll come along. We want to film you getting the grafting, and this is going to be part of the story. Here's all the things we're going to do. And uh, yes. so. This was the plan, months and months and months like we're planning this, but we had to get the Westchester Land Trust on board. 
And there were brand new owners on this property as well who knew nothing, right, about my family at all. So what took the land truck at, trust it took a minute and they finally said yes and they wrote me and they said listen can you send us a picture and show us where that tree is and so I sent them this photograph and you can see it there next to the pink hydrangea bush right and it was actually right near the house and I I was kind of surprised they didn't know that because I just assumed that there's a conservation easement isn't everything protected what I found was that actually a conservation easement on a piece of land does not mean everything on that land is protected and I found out that that tree was not protected. So in early 2021, this is the picture they sent me back. Everything had been landscaped. The tree was gone. And I have to tell you that, oh, I went to a bad place for a few days. I went to a bad place. The director was devastated. Yes, it looked like the project was dead in the water, but it was something so much deeper for me about, you know, it, it was the one thing, the one thing that they had there that somebody unknowingly, unknowingly cut down. And by the third day, I called the director and I said, you know what, this is a story we need to tell. This is a story of erasure because this is what always happens. And about a day or two later, I thought about it a little longer. And I said, you know, what if we could get everybody on board to plant a new weeping cherry tree? What if we could get the new owners, the HBO film crew, the New York Botanical Gardens, the Westchester Land Trust, everybody on board to plant a new tree? It took a little doing. The New York Botanical Gardens loved the idea right away as did the the film crew took a little longer to get the land trust on board, but they said yes, and they even offered to buy the tree. I was going to do it myself, but they offered to buy it. But the new owners weren't responding to the land trust or New York Botanical Gardens. And I finally said, let me write them a personal letter. It's a white couple who were medical doctors. And I never used the word race once. I talked about my parents being African-American, I'm black, you know, but I didn't say anything about race. I just told a little bit about who they were and who I was and the importance for me of honoring them. They're in their 90s, you know, and I don't know how much longer they have. And it would be so important because my parents think that, <coughs> that they've left us nothing. And they need to know that this story, with this story, they've actually left us everything. A woman wrote me back in 20 minutes that I would love to honor your family. And so last summer, summer um, 2021, in July, we all descended on the property to plant new trees. It was about 10 of us, um, a small film crew, a young Black filmmaker who was there, um, uh, a Black Dr. Omi Jones, who had been my dramaturge, the um, president of the land trust a wonderful forester and one of the owners. Now, I just wanna pause for a second and it looks like I'm doing all the work of the digging. I really wasn't, they asked me, the forester, he did all the work. You know, he asked me to come up, it was more symbolic than everything. And it was 95 degrees that day. <coughs> but everybody participated, including the owner um, in watering and taking care of this. And I, this is getting near the end of my talk, and I'm saying this to say that for me, there was no need to cancel anyone out. It didn't matter who planted the tree. The owners had no idea. We showed them pictures of what the land used to look like when my parents were on it. The last owner before that had gotten rid of all the fruit trees, all the flower beds, all the vegetable gardens, everything that needed daily tending they had took out. So they had no idea of what the land looked like before. Now, the land is beautiful regardless, right? But they had no idea what had gone in before. The land trust promised me that they would send me a photo. They would keep abreast of what, you know, how the tree was doing. And they sent me this in April. What moved me was not simply the tree. Excuse me, was that the owners had taken it upon themselves surround it with daffodils. And what they couldn't have known 
you said daffodils are my father's favorite flower. And so it's a very small gesture, but it transforms in my mind some small traumas, some small pains. Um, there's something that we all become accountable to. The story isn't simply mine anymore or my family's. It's now the new owner's story. They have a place in it. It's the president of the land trust who wants to think about how to bring story into her work. It is the HBO film crew. It is about the young black filmmaker who's on there. It is everybody who was there that day. Because at the end of the day, this is everybody's story. The pain of it, the beauty of it, and the possibility of it. I always believe that we're playing a long game in this justice game, right? There's no end game, right? Um, this is a painting from the African-American painter Robert S. Duncanson. And back when President Biden was inaugurated, Senator Roy Blount presented him this painting as um, a gift. And it so shocked me when Roy Blount, Senator Blount said, you know, this was an African-American painter who was painting this landscape in 1859 with a rainbow. And I thought, well, wait a minute, a black man in 1859 when slavery was still in place. So his body was seen as could be seen as property was painting a landscape with a rainbow and everything that a rainbow symbolizes possibility, potential, um, that somehow he believed in that. And I have to believe that Mr. Duncanson was playing the long game, that he understood that there was something after him after this moment. I read that he suffered from mental illness. And I actually believe the whole country suffered from different forms of mental illness at that time. So finally, I want to say that um, I learned this Japanese term uh, called kintsugi. And I love this term because I understood that it means that if they break a piece of pottery, they don't throw it away. They mend it with gold. And it's not simply for me the mending with gold, but the opportunity that that gives us to practice being better, the better people that we are, the better people that we can be. A few weeks ago, <coughs> I spoke at Bates College about reparative gestures. Um, and I wrote here, you know, how we can transform trauma and pain, not forget it and deny it. Our reparative gesture is not about righting some wrong. It's about an intention to do better, an intention to see better. It's about your healing and mine and the earth in which we depend. It is about honoring our humanity and all of its mystery and incomprehensibility. It's about remaining curious and compassionate and empathetic and present while looking to the future. Um, <coughs> Cornell West, near the end of his talk here, um, when he was here a few weeks ago, he quoted a line from a W.H. Auden poem, uh, um, As I Walk Out One Evening, because he was, um, Brother West was talking about how we all are, you know, cracked vessels. And I wanna read to you one line which is, oh, stand, stand at the window as the tears scald and start. You shall love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. Um, I don't believe it's about waiting until we figured it all out or waiting until we get it right or even coming to some place of grace. You know, often when I work with um, predominantly white groups in particular around social, racial, and environmental justice, they often ask me, but what if we get it wrong? And I wonder, what if we've been asking the wrong question? Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, who's an African-American marine biologist, who in her words, loves humanity and loves the oceans, she asked the question, what if we get this right? So I'm still working on it with Sarah the Great, but I'm gonna bring my crooked heart to bear. Come as you are, love as we are, love as you are, because we need it. The earth needs it. Thank you. <coughs> she can't hear it. 
Dr. Fanny. It's for you. So that Jennifer, with you. Can you hear this? Oh, I can hear that. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, we have time for like one or two questions from the audience. Any questions or remarks? Hello, Dr. Finney, thank you. My question um, is, what, what was that prompt that you give your students at the beginning of the semester? Did you say prompt? Yeah, what are the prompts that you give your students around doing their, um, their, their history? Yeah, I don't, it's not a prompt because what I actually do is I, <laughs> I tell a series of stories. We have some conversations about issues of rep representation, issues of narrative, but it's also about creativity because I, I'm asking them not to, um, to use their skills as students, you know, that they would lend to a research paper, but not to write a research paper, you know, to like sort of expand on in service to the story that it is they want to tell. So I often tell, I use my story, and I actually do have a page, a long page of different kinds of questions they can ask. And so I know that's what you're asking me, I think. And I'd have to pull it up to, to tell you what that is. Um, because I said, there's no, you know, some people want to talk about the farm they grew up on. And some people, you know, grew up in the city and, you know, the time they took a trip somewhere, you know, where, you know, a piece of land that has, you know, that is important to you, a piece of a place that you love, a place that has informed you, that has shaped you. Um, I, you know, I'm working on, I've been, I've done it about seven times now. I've workshopped this uh, performance piece that it's literally just scaffolding. I try things out with different audiences in order to get their feedback. Um, and one of the things that I do at the end, I don't usually tell people this because then if I do ever do it, you know it's coming, but I ask them to, I have given them, they've already got a program and it's a, a pull out that says love notes. And I ask them to take a couple of minutes at the very end and write a love note to a place that they love or, you know, that they feel so, that they feel strongly about. And then to leave that for me. And I've got, because I'm going to do something with all the love notes and I've got well over a hundred of them now. And, and it's incredible every time I do it, how everybody gets to it. They have something to say about a place that is meaningful to them. And part of what I'm asking students to do, especially because it's an academic context, is to not rely solely on their intellect, you know, but to actually think about their heart and their spirit and all the ways they feel, you know, for a place, you know, that, yes, and how they think about it. And yes, pull on those skills, you, your writing skills and your analytical skills and your research skills, but not solely on that. Dream about it. How do you get to a deeper place? How do we make ourselves vulnerable and authentic to a story? And I know for a number of the students I engage with at Middlebury, which is a predominantly white campus, you know, that there's some fear of what that means, a different kind of fear than maybe some of the students of color who have a different set of concerns, right, about what it means to engage that story. And I say, don't judge yourself, just be discerning about it. This is also, a, you know, how do you allow yourself to dig deeper? Look, if I go deeper into the land that I grew up on, I, I know that there were indigenous people on that land way before my parents were ever on there, you know, way before all the ownership, you know, so far I've gone back to 1800s. I know that for a fact, right? So it isn't only about who is on that land. And I should be able to talk about that without d denying the place my family has that history too, right? And so there's a lot that I say in there and, you know, there is a page I give them um, and I could certainly share that with you.
So we have time for like literally one more. And I love you all. Okay. Dr. Finney, thank you so much, um, especially I know how ill you've been and I appreciate your dedication to um, our students here. So thank you for meeting with our students earlier today and thank you for your um, time this evening. Uh, can we get one more round of applause for Dr. Finney? All right, thank you. We'll, we'll um, look forward to meeting you in person one day. I would love that. that this, this, this week was <laughs> something else for me, but I, again, I appreciate all of you and your time and allowing me to come in and share. Um, I wasn't as fast as I usually am, a little, a little bit slower, but I hope you all were able to take something away and, um, and that the rest of your summit is fabulous and you know go on and do fabulous things and yeah i hope i get to meet all of you in person that would be wonderful thank you so if you're interested um i don't know why i'm speaking into this but if you're interested we do have copies of dr finney's book out in the lobby to purchase and we will see you all in the morning <laughs>